If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. As you're turning there, I'll tell you that when Maggie was almost four, I took her to see her first movie in the theater. And she wanted to go see a Pixar movie called Monsters Incorporated. So we were all excited to go, and I, I came loaded with plenty of snacks. Uh, we got popcorn at the theater, and I also packed some uh, gummy worms and, and also some juice boxes. So we were ready. We're all set up. She went to sit up close. We were up there kind of looking up, and we're really excited. Well, it, for those of you that, that saw the movie, even on the, the video, but especially in the theater, they've got a little short film at the beginning called For the Birds. And it's really cute. It's a well-done mini film. It's about three and a half minutes long. So after it's over, well, the credits start rolling up on this little short film. Maggie hops out of her chair, grabs my hand, says, Come on, Daddy, it's time to go. And I, I tried to explain to her. And, you know, but I, I'm thinking in her mind, well, if you add in all of the coming attractions and stuff, we'd been in there about 30 minutes, which is how long her shows were on TV. So I said, no, 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 you need to sit back. The real show is about to start. As Steve talked about uh, with the Jews returning from exile to rebuild their lives, I'm sure some were, were feeling uh, that, man, some of the same sentiments as our daughter, that it's over. They had rebuilt the temple, but... Those that had, had seen it earlier in their life began to weep because they didn't have the same size or grandeur as the one that had been destroyed before. And yes, they're, they're back there in, in Jerusalem and they're back trying to do this, but it was more likely they were living in an outer suburb of the Persian Empire. And when Alexander the Great came in in 332 B.C., it, it was like their mortgage had been sold out to another lender you know, they're under the thumb of one, but under the thumb of, of another. And so they never had complete freedom when they're going through this. And the whole idea of, of God calling them as his holy nation that's going to be set apart so that they can influence others. Well, that had to seem like a distant dream. Camelot was done. This whole plan of God, well, it had fallen by the wayside. They're a diminished group. The, the Jews have been spread out all over the diaspora, and they're, they're spread out. And so God is, is still got some plans, but the people are thinking, what in the world's going on? It's been 400 years, and, and, and the prophet had talked about some wonderful things that are supposed to happen. We haven't heard from God in a long time. He hadn't risen up a prophet to tell us what's next. And so these years have sometimes been called the, the silent years. And so the, the people are, are beginning to think that the, the story is over. Come on, Daddy, it's over. It's time to go until now. Well, this morning, Matthew is going to introduce us to the long-awaited story of Jesus. This thing that, that we see traces of. Now, I've tried to point out in this cover-to-cover -cover series, we see some things that and at the time the people couldn't quite see that were happening. It's now happening. People are starting to put the pieces together. And here we have the story of, of Jesus, the one who changes uh, everything. It's interesting that the Gospel of Mark apparently was the first of the Gospels uh, to be written down and, and recorded. And a lot of scholars believe that, that Mark was, was this first document that both Matthew and Luke kind of took a look at when they started writing theirs. But it was Matthew. Matthew became the Gospel that was most used within the churches in the first century. Well, I, th I think this is true for a couple of reasons. One is this uh, decidedly Jewish tone, that it, it, it kind of serves as a, as a bridge between the writings of the Old Testament and what's happening now. And so you have this Jewish flavor, and so the, the Jewish Christians are, are, are tuning into what Matthew's trying to say, that Jesus is the person that we've been waiting for. And it's also an orderly arrangement of his teachings. It was the most often used gospel in the church. But I think it's more than that, because the content in Matthew's gospel, what's there? When you start reading it, it signals us, and signals to the readers, that the religious world, the thing that we've been used to, is about to be turned on its ear. Everything that has been set up to this point, all that's going to be pushed aside, and a new era is going to be coming in. So let's read together. 
Because we have this, this action-packed story. The real show is about to start. And how do we get started with this exciting story? A genealogy. Okay. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, right off the bat, by Matthew describing Jesus as the son of, of David, He's telling us that he belongs in Israel's royal line. He deserves all the praise he's been given. He has the, the right pedigree. And he's fulfilling all the messianic predictions and, and expectations. So what Matthew is, is trying to do here, and if you read on this week uh, through Matthew, you're going to see 11 times he points back to what's already been said. And 11 times he goes back there and he pulls these texts what he says here is, this is the guy we've been waiting for. And the phrase that he uses, this was to fulfill what was said through the prophets. This isn't some guy that just showed up. This is the one we've been waiting for. The one that we were instructed to, to watch. He is this king. He is the son of David, the rightful heir to Israel's throne. But it's more than that. Matthew also calls him the son of Abraham. So he is a, a Jew. And as he'll be described later, he's the king of the Jews. But by, by calling him a son of Abraham, it, it does a couple things. It reminds him we're a called out people, a people that's been blessed. But it also reminds them that what the call that was given to Abraham was not just to be a blessed people to enjoy these blessings, but also to reach out into the nations. And so Matthew is, is going to show us right here, and it's also going to Allow that to, to come forward and be the, the shining crescendo at the end of his gospel with the Great Commission. Go out into all the nations. And so while it's, yes, it's about the Jews and it has a lot of the Jewish history within it that they would understand, it's decidedly a document that's calling them to go to their calling and to revive this mission. So after this key verse... It's just kind of a, a list of names that few people bother to spend time and read. But if you glance at the names, well, there's a few meaningful surprises. Namely, four women are included in this. And you know, that, that's not all that big a deal today. But back then, this was huge. See, the Middle Eastern genealogies were a list of men, period, in the story. And if, if you look at Luke's telling of this, 76 men, boom, 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 boom. This is the father, this is the son. This is the son, and it keeps going on down there. 76 men, not a single woman listed. Why would Matthew do this? What's he trying to accomplish? Because uh, the first people that read this, alarms are going off. What's going on in their mind? What is he trying to reach out to them? Well, I, I think it's important for us to go back to these stories. The first one listed is a gal named Tamar. You probably remember her from Genesis chapter 38. I'm going to do a little backup on history. You have Abraham, and a Abraham's son's name was Isaac. Okay, and Isaac has twins whose names were Jacob and Esau. But the, the blessings of God go through the younger son, the younger of the twin whose name was Jacob. Okay, and Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, and then he had how many sons? Twelve, and at least one daughter named Dinah. But the, the twelve sons become the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, Judah is one of the older sons. He's called, uh, what was his nickname? The Lion, the Lion of Judah. So he is this, this blessing that, and, and this, this fierce person. So Judah is this guy, and Judah has several sons. And Tamar is married to Ur, the oldest son of Judah. But un unfortunately, Ur was not all that faithful to the Lord, so the Lord struck him down. Okay, so now you have Tamar, who's now a widow. And the Jews practice a custom of the leveret marriage. And th this was to protect not only the widows, but it was also to protect the estate of, of their husband that had passed away if they didn't have an heir to pass it on to. So the, the whole custom that they were living under is is if this son died and the family had another son, they would allow the widow to go marry the younger brother or another brother from the family uh, to kind of carry on the line. Any 
any children that would come out of that new union would then take on the estate and the name uh, of the husband that had died the first time. So that's what's going on. And so Judah decides, okay, I'm going to honor this. And so she, he gives Tamar, another one of his sons. Well, unfortunately, he was doing some things the Lord wasn't happy with, and so the Lord killed him as well. And so Tamar's like going, now what do I do? Um, Judah, I, I know you've got one more son. He's like, he's not even of age. He's not ready. She goes, that's okay, I'll wait. So she goes back to her parents' house and waits for this son to go through adolescence and grow and to develop into a young man. And when he's finally ready for, for marriage age, Tamar's like, okay, I'm, I'm ready too. I'm ready to get on with my family. But Judah's like, I don't want to send my last son to the black widow. You know, bad things happen when the, she marries one of my sons. So she comes up with a plan. Having heard that her father-in-law would be going out of town to shear the sheep, Tamar goes ahead, and she sits on the road dressed as a prostitute. And so when he comes along, he kind of propositions her. In Genesis 38 and verse 16, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come on, come now, let me sleep with you. What will you give me for me to sleep with you, she asked. And they agree on a goat for the price of her services. But, but Tamar asked for his staff and his signet ring as well to guarantee that he's going to be faithful to this. He's going to bring this, this goat back. And so unknowingly, he sleeps with his daughter-in-law and Taylor, uh, Tamar becomes pregnant. And when the word of her condition gets back to Judah, he's furious. She must have been doing something wrong. And so he sends out the word to have her burn. But as his servants are going to drag her out, she says, not so fast. Please go send a message to my father-in-law and tell him that the signet ring and staff belong to the person. And I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. And so Judah receives these, and the first thing that goes through his mind is, oops, what have I done? And so this becomes the first woman that's added into this story. And, and Tamar's rights were upheld by this bold, bold and daring plan. But, but according to the law, according to Leviticus, they both should have been stoned. They both should have been snuffed out. That's what the law required, but instead she's added in. She's listed as one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. Well, it doesn't get much better than our second female entry, and that's Rahab. She's known in, in scriptures as just the harlot. And Rahab was, was a resident of the famed city of Jericho. And you remember the story that, that under Joshua's leadership, they're going to enter into the promised land, and Jericho becomes the first stop on the journey. We talked about this earlier in the year. And he sends out, instead of 12 spies, that didn't work out the first time, he says, well, there were just two of us, I'll send two in to kind of do this reconnaissance mission. Well, they're discovered, and it was Rahab who goes in and hides these spies. Why does she do this? The text tells us she recognized that the Hebrew God was the one true God. And she says, even though I'm going against my community, I want to be aligned with God. And so she, she risked life and limb to save these guys. And in return, she is, is held and her and her family are saved when the walls of Jericho come down. So even though she is this harlot, she too gets added into the genealogy of Jesus. And the text tells us that she changed her ways and was, was counted as righteous, and even displaying this amazing faith. So the, the, who's the, the third person? Well, that's Ruth. And Ruth, in the midst of a famine, this Hebrew family decides to travel across the border into Moab to kind of seek some, uh, some food and, and, and just try to survive it and wait this thing out. And so you, you have this husband and wife and their two sons, and the two sons end up marrying Moabite wives. Y'all know this, but I'm trying to bring everyone up to speed. And after some time, the father dies, and so does the two sons. And the family, you know, was reduced to just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. She didn't really have a strong connection to them. Uh, the only reason that, that they're part of the family is they had married her sons. Well, that tie is no longer there. And so Naomi says, you know what? If, if I'm going to survive, I've got to get back to my homeland. I've got to go back to, to my extended family, to my kin. And so she says, you girls stay here. 
find your new spouse. Let's go, go back to your, your parents' home. And so one did. She said, but Ruth says, no, your people are going to be my people. I'm going to travel with you. I, I feel this connection. There, there's something you have that I don't have. And so she travels with her back to Bethlehem and begins picking grain in the field, just trying to survive as they're starving to death. You know what happens now. As the two of them return to Bethlehem, Ruth meets a wealthy, distant relative of Naomi's family named Boaz. And during the harvest time, Ruth goes to Boaz and says, I, I would like to, for you to exercise the Leverett Law, and I would like you, as my kinsman redeemer, to take me in as your spouse. And in the end, Boaz took the young woman to be his bride. And then the process becomes the great-grandparents of King David. And finally, there's Bathsheba, or as Matthew calls her, the wife of Uriah. Why would he do that? See, she too has a story. Her husband's off fighting for Israel. She decides one evening to to start bathing by an open window that had to be facing the palace. We don't know if she did this on, on purpose. We, we simply don't know. But archaeologists in that, uh, from that day that have uncovered some stuff have found that the closest dwellings to the palace were within 20 feet. So whether she chose to do this facing the open window so that, that perhaps the king would notice her and she could move up in class, we, we don't know if it's an accident or she chose to do this. But whether it was innocent or not, she definitely was noticed by the king. David sent his word for her to, to come up, and they soon slept with each other, and she got pregnant. David gets into damage control, try, trying to cover up the initial sin. And you know, she says, I'm, but I'm married, and so well, let's take care of that, and let's move him up to the front lines, and then we'll take a step back. So he sends word with Uriah taking his own death orders, and all that is cleaned up. And, and David and Bathsheba think that, they, they get a, that they've gotten away with it, but Nathan the prophet comes in and tells them, in fact, the Lord knows exactly what's going on. And so the, the child of this affair did not make it, but Solomon, their next child, eventually would take the throne. Well, what was mo Matthew's motivation for including these four in the genealogies of Jesus? Why, why do you feel like he had to add these? I mean, couldn't you just hit the, hit, hit, hit the high points and, 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 and hit some of the, the positive people in here? Why include these? What are you trying to communicate? He's the, the first gospel that's introducing us to this grand story. Why does he put them in? I think there's a variety of reasons, but I'm going to give you three. It's, as this tax collector pulls back the curtain on the greatest story ever told, his first job is it, 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 not to tell you the story. His first job is to describe the audience. Who is it that's going to be able to hear the story of Jesus? Before I tell you anything about it, I've got to tell you who's out here, who's about to see this grand play, who God intends this message to go out to. And, and the first is to men and to women. This is a major point. We'll see in, in Luke chapter 8, that, that Jesus includes women in his band of disciples. You know, a lot of times we assume it's just Jesus and the 12 walking around for, for three years. But women play a very important part and are there, even though they're not mentioned all the time. And I'm sure there's times when it's just the 12. But there's a lot of time it's a much larger entourage that's going with them. And these women have a prominent place in his ministry. And his teachings are often geared to both men and women listeners. So what Matthew is doing is, that with this inclusion of women in his genealogy, he's signifying we're ushering in a new kingdom. Things are going to be different. Things are going to look different. And I want to encourage the female listeners out there and the feminine believers, come out of the shadows. This message is for you. You're no longer rele relegated to a second-class citizen here in the first century. I want you to realize things are changing. Things are about to get dramatically different with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And men and women prophesying together. The second thing is, this message was for both Jews and Gentiles. Well, if, if Matthew wanted to include Jews and Gentiles, how's he going to accomplish that? Because the bloodline of the Jews was transferred from father to son and, 
and son to father, all the way down. So if he's going to pull in the Gentile, it's going to have to be through the females. So if all the males in the family tree were Jews, the only way he could include the Gentiles in the gospel was through these women. So we have Ruth, who is a Moabitess, and we also know that uh, Rahab was a Gentile from Jericho. And, and Tamar is listed in pre-Christian literature as Armenian. Don't know if that's true or not, but that's definitely what most scholars were, were thinking at, at the time. And there's a good chance that Bathsheba, she could have been married to a Hittite when he came in town, married, or perhaps she was a Hittite as well and came in. Either way, she's married to a Gentile. So in, in the inclusion of these women in the genealogy, if, if that didn't catch the attention of, of those that were reading this, having Gentiles attached to the bloodline of Jesus, that definitely raised some flags. Why are they in there? What is Matthew trying to do with this? Because they wanted to tie everything back to Abraham and the pure bloodlines. Certainly, the infusion of Gentiles into this had to have raised, well, they, they were well aware of it. Though Matthew was written from a Jewish perspective, the mention of Gentiles, the opening passage, it, 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 so that's right here at the beginning. And that's going to be mirrored with the mission to the Gentiles and the Great Commission. Well, the, the final thing that we see in here, and I, the, the reason I think that they're added, is because he also wanted to include saints and sinners. Saints and sinners. Ruth throughout this time remains a saint. You know, she was just wonderful, and some people say, well, when she approached Boaz and they tried different things, but there's just not enough facts for us to know that. So we're going to say that she was a saint throughout the entire story. And, and, and Rahab appears to act faithfully in all that she does, but she enters the stage as a prostitute. And there's not much you can say about Tamar and Bathsheba and their actions. But they too have been grafted into the lineage of Jesus. This isn't just for men. This isn't just for Jews. And it's not just for those that have it all together. Saints and sinners, women and men, all are included. He wanted to make sure that there was no designation where people can say, love that story, but it's not for me. What Matthew is saying here, Right here in, Gen in, in Matthew chapter 1, this story is for you. Before I tell you about this great story that's going to change your life, let me tell you, you're welcome to be a part of this audience. God wants you. Hey, how does this story impact us? Where do we fit in in all this? First, I, I think that we need to acknowledge that Jesus, God's Son in the flesh, becomes the central event of all time. You're like, well, yeah, that makes sense. But what Matthew makes a point in his opening words of genealogy, what he actually says is a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Literally what that means is the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ. Here, here's where things are different. Usually in genealogy, you describe who you are, and then you see the ancestors one after another. But what Matthew is doing here is different. He, Matthew's words are profound. So much that Jesus is, is the point of history. So that what he's talking about is instead of those that come after him, he's talking about those that have gone before. And those that are listed as genealogy, suddenly their lives take new shape based on his story. So it goes backwards instead of forwards. It's just an incredible for us to think about this. This focal point of all of history depends on Jesus. Without this, Ruth's story is nice. After her husband dies, she remains faithful to her mother-in-law. Not many people do that. And yet she travels in. She's poor, and because of her strong work ethic and her character, she gets noticed by the richest guy in town, and she gets a new husband and a new... That's nice. It doesn't merit the weight that we put on it without who she becomes because of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus in the future, that comes back and it changes the story of Ruth forever. Do we understand that? I hope we do. You consider this poor girl from Moab gets grafted into the earthly line of Jesus Christ. Gives it whole new meaning. So it's almost like Jesus becomes 
this giant rock that's dropped into a pond. And so you have these ripples, these concentric rings that go out. And so they're backing up. We're starting to see God's plans. As we're reading through this, and folks, we're reading through Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they didn't understand. They said even the disciples were piecing some of this together after Jesus had gone up. They're rereading Scripture going, oh, that's what he meant. Remember the whole donkey thing? Yeah, it says it right here. We didn't understand why he wouldn't get a horse. Don't get a donkey. It's fulfilling these prophecies. So you drop this in, and these rings back up, and these stories, what God has been doing all along, suddenly makes sense in a whole new way. It doesn't just go backwards. It goes forward. Because we're talking about how this changes us. What does Paul say? He says, we're added to the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.26, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 4.7, but since you're a son, God has made you also an heir. So as this rock gets dropped in the pond, we've got these rings that are going backwards. They're also going forwards. Each of us jump in on what's happening. Each of us jump into this lineage. We're part of this story. A lot of times you'll talk with people about their faith journey and they'll say, well, I'm a fourth generation Christian. What does that mean? You're a fourth generation Christian. Well, it means your, your dad and your grandpa and your great grandmother and, and, and grandpa, they, they all became Christians. What that really means is your heritage changed at the point that your great grandparents joined in on the story because that story has gone forward and forward and forward you now are part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. We're heirs according to that promise. We're a part of that story that's going forward, just as Ruth was part of the story that was going backwards. That's how important Jesus Christ was and how that goes back and forwards on into his second coming. The second thing we need to realize is Jesus is for you. Not because of who you are, because of who he is what he's done for us there's no tryout. we don't try to figure things out and get better before we can come to Jesus what was the entry point of these women they came when they intersected and understood about who Yahweh was and were brought into this story God took them where they were there's no getting yourself together like Rahab, we encounter the Lord God Almighty. We understand who that is. Suddenly, she turns her back on that old life. The whole life that she knew, not just her lifestyle, but her community as well. She says, I'm facing this way. I'm part of a new people. I'm, I have a new identity. My, my life has totally changed. There's no, well, I don't know, should I go back to this? Should I go back to my old ways? No. That life has died. This is my new people, my new identity. I am a new person because of encountering the Lord God Almighty. We've got to understand that. We don't get righteous before pursuing God. We step out in faith like she did and just trust that if God is all-powerful, he's the one that's going to fill in the blanks. He's the one that's going to begin this great work inside of you and inside of me. This morning, we'd like to offer an invitation an invitation not just to, to read about Jesus, though we're certainly going to do that over the next few weeks, but an invitation to actually come to Jesus. If you read in, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, we had angels coming down and they're proclaiming. What is it they're saying? His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what's the final thing that, that Jesus says? In Matthew 28, in verse 20, Lo, I am with you until the very end of the age. So from the time he's an infant, and they're proclaiming who he is, is God with you. And as he leaves to return to his Father, Lo, I'm with you till the very end of the age. He's communicating what Matthew's doing is, he's putting it out and said, from start to finish, I'm with you, and I want you. 
not just to save you from your sins. I'm going to do that on the cross. But I'm also bridging a gap so you can have relationship and community with our Heavenly Father. I want you to come to Him. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want you to have a relationship. He desperately wants you close to Him. No sin is going to separate you from Him. I, I think sometimes we, we feel like we're an outsider. When it comes to matters of faith, we look at others and, well, I just don't feel like I, I fit in there. I'm not sure that this message is really for me. Look at these outsiders that were in this story. Is there anyone that, that can look at these stories and, and say, well, God's not going to let me in? Because certainly, look at these ladies. God worked surprisingly, not only to help bless their lives, but also to, didn't leave them on the outside. He brought them into the story to bless his people as well. This morning, he wants your story to become his story. I, I pray that each of us won't listen to Satan when he tries to convince us that matters of faith, come on, it, it, it's over. You, you've tried, but it just didn't work. We come to Jesus. The real show is about to start. If there's anything we can do this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. We invite you to come to Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Who hears the cry of the barren one? Oh, me the mercy of Jesus.